Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Marianne Anderson and I'm talking about uh, the same problem, resistance to a novel agent, but this time with venetoclax treatment. Uh, important for you guys to keep in mind that I'm an employee of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and receive milestone payments in relation to venetoclax. So to this audience, venetoclax doesn't need a great deal of explanation. Uh, we're all familiar with the early phase results of monotherapy studies showing uh, in relapsed and refractory patients up to an 80% response rate, which can be deepened uh, when used in combination with rituximab. However, the Achilles heel of the drug appears to be, at least in the relapsed and refractory setting, that patients almost inevitably go on to develop resistant disease over time. And this is especially true if patients fail to achieve deep remissions, such as CR or MRD negativity. What we've seen uh, when patients relapse on venetoclax is really two patterns. In the first pattern, uh, it tends to occur within a year and often is characterised by highly proliferative disease and is enriched for patients with a rictus transformation. These early progressors tend to have bulky adenopathy at the time of entering uh, onto treatment with venetoclax and are often uh, BTK inhibitor resistant. These, we've shown that these patients are uh, characterised by karyotypic complexity, and others have shown uh, loss of CDK and N2, uh, biallelic loss, as a feature of progression in this group of patients. There's another group of patients who progress, however, and these patients tend to progress beyond two years. They tend to be uh, less heavily pretreated with less bulky adenopathy and are not as enriched for BTK-resistant patients. This group of patients are likely to represent the majority of patients seen on venetoclax treatment going forward as the drug moves earlier and earlier into the treatment paradigm. And it's this group of patients that I want to focus on today. And I'd like to talk to you about some of the really exciting data that we and others are generating regarding genomic changes at the time that these patients develop resistance. So to understand resistance to venetoclax, we really have to understand apoptosis and the way in which venetoclax works. So bear with me while we uh, go through a couple of mechanistic slides. Uh, under conditions of cellular stress, such as cytotoxic therapy from fludarabine, for instance, the BH3 only family of proteins are activated. These bind to and inhibit the BCL2 family of proteins, removing the block that BCL2 imposes on backs and back, unleashing backs and backs to uh, activate caspases and condemn cells to inevitable apoptotic death. In uh, B cell malignancies where BCL2 is upregulated, this upregulation of BCL2 means that when BH3 only proteins are activated, they are insufficient to overcome this block on apoptosis, and thus the cells survive inappropriately. Venetoclax is a BCL2 selective inhibitor. Uh, and what this enables it to do is to bind to that excess BCL2, remove the block on apoptosis. And uh, one of the things we see with venetoclax treatment is a very profound early cell death as a result of this. So what are the mechanisms that have been implicated in cell line and in vitro data for venetoclax resistance? So loss of p53 function with a subsequent reduction in BH3 only proteins. BCL2 mutations um, would be a obvious uh, potential target for driving resistance. Upregulation of other pro-survival proteins such as BCLXL or MCL1. Reduction in BH3 only protein activity. Loss of backs or back. And of course, no talk about resistance is really complete without understanding resistance in the context of patients and their micro and the patient cells in the microenvironment. Uh, I only have 15 minutes to talk, so I'm going to focus on uh, the areas for which we have some initial data. So P53 dysfunction, BCL2 mutations, other pro-survival proteins, and the microenvironment. Let's start with P53. So BCL2 uh, 
and venetoclax, actually that interaction is occurring downstream of the P53 pathway. And it's not immediately apparent why P53 dysfunction would induce venetoclax resistance. Uh, our own data in isogenic human cell line, in isogenic cell lines shows that in P53 dysfunctional cell lines that the sensitivity to venetoclax is identical to P53 intact cell lines. Similarly, when we treat uh, primary human cells that are venetoclax naive with B venetoclax in vitro, these cells ident um, demonstrate identical sensitivity to venetoclax irrespective of their P53 status. Uh, similarly, in the clinic, uh, the IWCLL response uh, is not affected by the P53 status of the patient. And when we look specifically at compartmental responses, lymphocyte count, nodal response, bone marrow infiltration by CLL, this is not affected by the patient's P53 status. Furthermore, data from the Murano study uh, shows that patients treated with rituximab bendamustine have a reduction in the ability to clear their MRD if they are P53 dysfunctional, whereas patients treated on the venetoclax rituximab arm had a similar reduction in MRD, uh, irrespective of their P53 status. Nonetheless, patients with 17P deletion relapse earlier than those without P53 deletion when treated with venetoclax. So TP53 aberration remains a prognostic factor with venetoclax and is associated on multivariate analysis with increased risk of relapse with a hazard ratio when considering pretreatment factors only of 1.8 and a hazard ratio of 1.9 when taken in conjunction with MRD status at two years. So putting all that together, P53 would appear to be permissive for resistance to venetoclax, but probably not causative. So just changing tracks now, track now, let's think about BCL2. And um, mutations in BCL2 in some way is the low hanging fruit uh, in terms of mechanism for BCL2 resistance. Uh, we have a cohort of 67 patients uh, in our centre who were treated on early phase venetoclax studies. Uh, of these patients, 18 progressed early with Richter's transformation and they were characterised by genomic heterogeneity and we're not going to consider that group further. A further 23 patients developed CLL progression uh, um, much later and of these 23 patients we were in a position to test pre and progression samples, so pre-treatment and progression samples uh, for uh, uh, BCL2 mutations. And we discovered in an initial cohort of four patients that there was a G101V mutation in BCL2. G101V um, has subsequently been verified independently by other groups. It has never been detected in patients who are venetoclax naive. And we have looked uh, specifically in other B cell malignancies and we have been unable to detect it. Furthermore, in five patients with Richter's transformation, we were unable to detect a G101V. G101V confers in competitive binding assays a reduction in the ability of BCL2 to bind to venetoclax compared to wild type BCL2. And this reduction is approximately 180 fold weaker than the wild type BCL2. Furthermore, uh, we've recently uh, published the crystal structure of BCL2 in combination with venetoclax uh, in the presence of the G101V mutation. And what happens is that uh, glutamate 152 moves into the P2 pocket uh, and this helps to displace venetoclax in the presence of this mutation. In cell lines, so two independent cell lines, when we, when we uh, have G101V compared to wild type, the, there is a uh, several fold reduction in sensitivity to venetoclax. Furthermore, in competitive binding assays, G101V uh, uh, provides the uh, cells expressing it with a competitive advantage over wild type cells. 
So in cells harboring G101V, this appears to be sufficient to explain why they become resistant to, resistant to venetoclax. However, that's not the whole story. So let's consider those first four patients in whom we described this mutation. We went back uh, and performed digital dot PCR on serial samples from prior to starting venetoclax through to the time at which they developed progression. And what we found was that G101V uh, was detected at low variant allele uh, frequency between nine and 42 months after starting venetoclax. And it was detectable up to 24 months prior to the development of clinical resistance. However, at the time of progression on venetoclax, the um, proportion of CLL cells cont uh, containing G101V ranged between 26 and 70%. And so while G101V is sufficient to explain resistance in the cells that harbour it, it is not the whole story explaining resistance in the whole population of CLL in these patients. Subsequently, um, others have, and ourselves have described additional BCL2 mutations that are present in a uh, variable proportion of patients at the time of progression in a variable proportion of the tumour compartment. And I think the story around BCL2 mutations is going to continue to evolve. But we really need to consider these BCL2 mutations in the context of the microenvironment. So let's go back uh, to our cohort of patients. What we did was we tested, uh, we had the opportunity to test multiple samples at, uh, prior to venetoclax treatment and then at the time of relapse. And what we saw was that in all samples, patients, uh, the cells became less sensitive at relapse compared to uh, pre-treatment with venetoclax. However, in the green box is the concentration of venetoclax that we would expect to be able to achieve in humans. And so what you're seeing is that uh, while these cells are certainly less sensitive to venetoclax, uh, they are still being exposed to a concentration of venetoclax in vivo that you would expect to kill the cells. So what we did was we took those resistant cells and we cultured them on a stromal layer to mimic the microenvironment for a week. And what we saw was that in all instances, they then became even further uh, less sensitive to venetoclax, such that now they would not be expected to be exposed to a um, concentration of, an effective concentration of drug in vivo. And um, in red are cells that did harbour the G101V. So considering those four patients uh, in this series who harboured G101V, the questions really are, what are the other cell intrinsic mechanisms that are going on in addition to G101V that are explaining why these cells are resistant? We also don't fully understand the protective signaling pathways that are associated with the protection provided by the microenvironment and how these collaborate with the cell intrinsic pathways that are being upregulated. And most importantly, we need to understand this so that we can understand how to circumvent the development of resistance. So turning to the final uh, part of the equation, so to speak, the question really then becomes, can upregulation of other pro-survival proteins uh, help to explain that proportion of cells that don't harbour G101V, but are contributing to the resistance in the patient? And um, hopefully in the next two slides, I'll be able to uh, convince you that the answer is almost certainly yes. So this is really a case, a case study of one of our patients. So um, the first graph is uh, in vitro, an in vitro sensitivity assay. In black are her cells at the time uh, where we started venetoclax. As you can see, like most patients, she was exquisitely sensitive to venetoclax. Uh, in red is uh, a significant reduction in her in vitro sensitivity to venetoclax at the time of her development of progressive CLL. This lady harbored G101V in 25% of her cells. And we had the opportunity to perform mass cytometry on a number of patient samples at the time of relapse on venetoclax. And in this particular lady, what we could see was that there was an upregulation of BCLXL compared to other patients. So we fax sorted her, fax -sorted her CLL 
based on her BCLXL status, high or low, and then performed digital drop PCR looking for G101V. And what we found was really interesting. So in those cells that were uh, BCLXL high, there was almost never, we did not see G101V. In the cells that were BCLXL low, however, up to 49% harboured G101V. So what that is implying is that in this particular patient, we've been able to identify two mechanisms by which she's developing resistance. One is G101V, explaining resistance in those 25% of the cells that harbour it. The other is uh, BCLXL high. However, in this particular lady, there are still 25% of the cells that are resistant and we don't understand why. Um, the other question, of course, is why BCLXL is being, and how BCLXL is being upregulated. And uh, we're doing ongoing work to try to elucidate that. Finally, um, this is data presented by Kathy Wu yesterday, uh, which further contributes to this story. And her group has recently described um, a group of three out of six CLL progressors on venetoclax in whom MCL1 was upregulated, uh, potentially uh, defining a new, another mechanism that's contributing to resistance on venetoclax. So hopefully I've convinced you that there are multiple uh, subclonal uh, reasons why patients are developing resistance to this drug. And to conclude, I think it's clear that there are very few patients who don't respond to venetoclax. And this is implying that uh, subclonal resistance, likely of pre-existing subpopulations, is uh, explaining why these patients are starting to develop resistance after a period of two or more years. The mechanisms of resistance are emerging in patterns. Genomic instability is common early. TP53 dysfunction is permissive, but not sufficient. BCL2 mutations, G101V, D103, described by others, are being increasingly described in patients at the time of resistance. Uh, the microenvironment is clearly critical. Other BCL2 family proteins are likely to be implicated. And what is clear is that there are multiple independent subclones, and polyclonal heterogeneity is almost certainly the norm. Remains to thank a very large group of people who've made this work possible, our funding agents and of course our patients, and I'm open to questions. Thank you for that wonderfully articulate talk. Could we have some questions from the floor? Yes, Anand? Very nice data. Very, uh, so one question is that you actually are basing your, your assumptions from, from the blood, right? But if you indeed believe that B-cell cell cell is important, what do you think uh, mimics really what happens in the lymph node? Because that's the place where you see the residual nodes. Right? Do you think you see about B-cell or KT Wu MCL1, you think it's a resemblance of what happens in the node? Or do you think it's really something that happens in the blood that makes the cells more resistant? So. Um, it's true that most of our experiments are done on cells derived from the blood. Um, whether that is completely reflective of what's going on in the lymph node or not is unclear. Uh, but I think that uh, the mechanisms that we're describing in the blood are likely contributions to the overall picture of resistance that's emerging. Um, and absolutely, we would love to get our hands on some lymph node at the time of relapse to do similar tests on. Yes. The, um, one of the things with venetoclax is you get tumor lysis, so the cells die within hours of giving it. Um, but a week later, there's still some cells there, yes. and a month later, they're still there, which is still responding. Have you looked to see if there's difference between those cells? Um, so, yes. Yes and no is the answer. So one of the, <laughs> one of the difficulties is that um, as you know, venetoclax works extremely well. And so getting sufficient cells after a period of treatment can often be very challenging. And that's why we actually had to go back and do digital drop PCR to look for the G101V, because um, just sequencing um, the, the, the peripheral blood or the bone marrow sample, there usually weren't enough cells to be able to do you know, robust uh, experiments on. Uh, so, but you would hypothesize that those cells that are not killed by the initial insult with venetoclax are somehow different to those cells that are. And trying to tease out what those differences are 
uh, is probably going to explain, to some degree at least, the subclonal emergence down the track of resistance. So you would suggest, you would, you would hypothesize that the cells that are sensitive had killed off, and those that have potential for intrinsic resistance are the ones that are residually there and potentially down the track lead to resistant disease. Dr. Rye. A very good, instructive presentation. My question is, your statement that it is GLEE-101V is contributory, not causative. At clinical level, what difference does it make? The, so, does the drug become ineffective or we can continue to use it? Yeah. It is less effective. Yeah. So um, I'd like to clarify that. So in those cells that harbour G101B, I think that G101B explains their resistance in the context of the microenvironment. However, what we're seeing is that it's, it's subclonal, so not all the cells that are becoming resistant harbour it. And in fact, it might be as few as 25% of the resistant cells actually harbour G101B. So I think there are other explanations going on in a given population of resistant cells. And it um, is apparent to us that G101V emerges with um, progression of disease and ultimately um, emerges in concurrence with clinical progression. Of your uh, uh, resistant uh, to venetoclast CLL cell, how many have a much higher level of BCL2 than the previous uh, CLL? Yeah, so... Um, and how many have... Uh, very high level of row one. Yeah, so we haven't looked specifically at row one. Uh, there are a few patients that we've detected other, so BCL2 family aberrations uh, by mass cytometry, and we have detected patients where there is increased BCL2, um, but we have not been able to really characterise in a systematic way yet um, changes in BCL2, and one of the difficulties that we have is that we're looking at progression samples, so we don't necessarily have pre and progression samples to do the mass cytometry for BCL2 on. We have found that uh, Western blotting has not been a particularly uh, good uh, technique for showing increased uh, or a relationship between the BCL2 family and um, clinical progression. So we've been relying on mass cytometry and it's ch technically challenging because of the absence of pre-treatment um, sample. So, um, for instance, in the experiment I showed you with the patient with increased BCL XL, it was compared to other patients at the time of relapse that she had increased BCL XL. So it was using other patients with, uh, with progressive disease as the control. So, Thanks, so, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.